Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for attending this morning's session, which I believe it's going to be a very interesting channel uh, panel because the subject is very timely and it's very sensitive and it's very complicated. To do that, the organiza organizers of MedDays have lined up a great group of experts, and uh, I'm sure each one of them will speak for 10 to 15 minutes, not to exceed that because we need to have time for Q&As. Uh, the panels uh, consist today of, uh, I'm delighted to say that uh, Minister Trinidad Jimenez, she's the former Minister of uh, Foreign Affairs in Spain, and also we are delighted to have among us uh, Mr. Yusuf Amrani, the Deputy Foreign Minister, Morocco. Also among us is someone you have uh, already seen several times, Mr. Alan Bogan, Mark Alan Bogan. And also we are so happy to be joined by Mr. Frédéric Chaillon. He's the director of the Institute for Strategic uh, Research and, uh, at the military school. Thank you. And also among us, uh, General Robert Gard. He's uh, chairman of the Center for Armed Control and Non-Proliferation from the United States. And also I'm delighted to introduce the former Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs of Pakistan, Mustafa Kazi. Before we start by asking each member of the panel to address you for 10 to 15 minutes, I would like to invite Amin, who has prepared a, a very powerful presentation about the subject today, which is th security, threats to security, and the new architecture for international security. So please, Amin, proceed with your uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Mofaq. Mesdames et Messieurs, bonjour. Aujourd'hui avec nous dans la quatrième session plénière sur une nouvelle architecture de sécurité mondiale. Je voudrais juste partager avec vous certaines incertitudes sécuritaires qui résonnent des défis d'une mondialisation de la violence. Alors nous avons avec nous trois points. Une évolution des formes de violence qui est de plus en plus accrue. Un retour des crises majeures. Nous aurons, je ne dirais pas le plaisir, mais nous aurons le temps de voir avec ça la crise syrienne, mais aussi la crise de, dans le Sahel. Après, nous allons passer à la course infinie vers la moment qui est malheureusement un problème qui reste quand même assez récurrent. Nous parlons maintenant d'une évolution des formes de violence à l'air avec une, une dématérialisation de la guerre. Nous parlons de guerre 2.0, nous parlons de cyberguerre. Comme le montre l'infographie, la Chine a déjà attaqué les États-Unis, la Russie, l'Estonie, la Géorgie. Israël a déjà attaqué l'Iran mais tout simplement virtuellement, sans pour autant dire, ça a fait de beaucoup de dommages. Les centrifugeuses iraniennes ont resté hors circuit pendant pratiquement deux semaines et demie. Nous pouvons parler aussi des menaces liées au trafic de drogue. Le trafic de drogue, c'est pratiquement 500 milliards de dollars de chiffre d'affaires annuel. Ça le met dans le deuxième marché mondial, après celui de l'armement, et bien devant celui du pétrole. Pour vous dire, en fait, si tous les cartels du monde se mettaient ensemble, ce serait la 19e puissance mondiale. Nous allons parler aussi de la résurgence des crises. Nous avons parlé de la deuxième séance plénière de la développement en Afrique. Ben, je vais vous dire aussi qu'il y a beaucoup de problèmes en Afrique, qu'on a un arc de crise qui est vraiment, vraiment très préoccupant, que ce soit pour les acteurs régionaux, les acteurs du champ ou tout simplement pour les grandes puissances. Nous avons des États qui sont fragiles, des États qui font face à un risque terroriste vraiment très très important, des États en guerre, le Soudan avec le Sud-Soudan, et aussi tout simplement des États faillis, qui est la Somalie depuis bientôt des décennies. Nous aurons aussi dans notre panel de Syrie le régime syrien qui est sous haute pression, mais qui est aussi supporté par l'Iran, la Russie, la Chine, mais aussi avec une pression de plus en plus accrue de l'ONU, l'Union européenne, les États-Unis, aussi les pays du Golfe et surtout, surtout la Ligue arabe. Nous espérons que le Conseil national syrien pourra se mettre d'accord sur une structure interne, sur un organisme interne, pour ne pas tomber, malheureusement, dans une libanisation de la Syrie. Je voudrais aussi vous parler de la course infinie vers l'armement. Comme vous le voyez, les États-Unis restent le premier exportateur d'armement le plus gros dépensier militairement et les pays du Golfe restent aussi les plus grands importateurs d'armes avec une, une course, que ce soit avouée de la part par exemple de la Corée du Nord, que ce soit inavouée par exemple de la part de l'Iran, 
avoir l'arme nucléaire ou du moins le seuil nucléaire, ce qui permet d'avoir des négociations beaucoup plus à droite avec les grandes puissances. D'ailleurs, en parlant de la crise iranienne, on l'a vu hier, on en a bien parlé, la crise iranienne qui fait vraiment euh, beaucoup, beaucoup d'applications concernant que ce soit Israël, mais aussi la Turquie, l'Arabie Saoudite, mais surtout, surtout le Qatar, qui ne voudra jamais, jamais que l'Iran puisse avoir un seuil nucléaire. Je vous remercie pour votre attention. Wafak Bakhtur. Thank you, Ami, for this very inform informative presentation, which I believe will set the stage for what I expect to be a very lively uh, discussion among our panelists. Please allow me to introduce, to be our first speaker, Minister uh, Trinidad Jimenez, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I would like to start, let me start, by expressing my personal gratitude to the Amadeu Institute and its chairman, Brahim Fasifiri, for his kind invitation and organization. And let me also uh, speak in, in Spanish. I think it's better here in Tanger. I prefer speaking in Spanish. Um, in este momento, señoras y señores, creo que tenemos que ser conscientes que hay viejos uh, problemas que afectan a la seguridad mundial que coexisten con nuevos problemas. Los viejos problemas tienen que ver con la desigualdad, tienen que ver con la pobreza, tienen que ver con la falta de libertad, con la falta de democracia. Y hay nuevos problemas y nuevos retos en la actualidad con los que tenemos que hacer frente. Tenemos todavía el problema más importante, que es el problema del terrorismo, y tenemos otros nuevos problemas como es el cambio climático o las crisis financieras. La única forma de abordar y de enfrentarnos a estos problemas no puede ser solamente con la acción de un solo Estado. Un solo Estado hoy en el mundo no puede afrontar ninguno de estos problemas. Es necesario una fuerte coordinación a nivel internacional. Una coordinación que tiene que ser de carácter regional. Para España es muy clara la coordinación, uh, el trabajo que hemos venido realizando a nivel regional con los países de la ribera sur del Mediterráneo, por ejemplo, con Marruecos. Ha sido muy importante la coordinación siempre con Marruecos, la mejor manera para afrontar nuestros problemas comunes, pero también la coordinación a nivel internacional. Necesitamos estructuras internacionales para poder ofrecer soluciones coordinadas y soluciones globales. Eh, para luchar contra el terrorismo es fundamental la coordinación de los servicios de inteligencia y la coordinación a nivel política. Para enfrentarnos al cambio climático es absolutamente necesaria la coordinación internacional. Para enfrentarnos a las crisis financieras que está viviendo en este momento primero Estados Unidos, pero también ahora fundamentalmente Europa y España, es necesaria una coordinación internacional para controlar los flujos financieros sin control. Y es fundamental también la coordinación, como decía, para luchar contra el terrorismo, que es uno de los problemas más graves que persisten en la actualidad. Junto a ello, quiero insistir en esta primera exposición que tenemos que luchar contra la pobreza, contra la desigualdad, porque provocan inestabilidad entre los países. Y también tener claro que la única manera de lograr una mayor estabilidad a nivel eh, nacional, regional e internacional es consiguiendo el fortalecimiento de las democracias con el pleno respeto a los derechos fundamentales, al Estado de Derecho y a los derechos de todos los ciudadanos. Por tanto, yo diría arquitectura internacional, coordinación internacional, pero también establecimiento y fortalecimiento de las democracias, respeto a los derechos fundamentales, a las libertades y, uh, por supuesto, el imperio de la ley. Ese sería, desde mi punto de vista, las líneas fundamentales para afrontar 
eh, los problemas de seguridad global y de, reto, y de uh, retos que tenemos en la actualidad. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Minister. And not because of the proximity or the geographic proximity, but simply because probably we'll be talking about similar issues. I ask Deputy Foreign Minister Amrani to be our next uh, speaker. Well, thank you very much. It's not only proximity. We have friendship together because we have been working together for long, long years. And I think thanks to the complicity which exists between Morocco and Spain, we were able to uh, inaugurate a new uh, parameters in cooperation between Morocco and Spain and to face to face security challenges together, migration, uh, illegal migration, terrorism and so on. Bueno, yo no sé, de verdad que tenía una intervención, pero primeramente agradecerte, eh, Trini, que estás aquí con nosotros hoy mismo, porque es muy importante para esta relación eh, hispano-marroquí que seas presente, que sea presidente Zapatero y otros responsables españoles, porque estamos aquí en Tánger. Yo soy Tánger, ¿no? Por lo, tanto, por lo tanto, yo participo con mucho entusiasmo a este, a este, a, a este encuentro que favorece el intercambio entre dos orillas, dos países eh, importantes en la Arabia Saudí Mediterránea. Alors, uh, I don't know how I'm going to follow in English or French. How is this much better for you? Okay, let's let's. Okay, let's 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 start let's start by saying today that we have in the region a lot of conflicts, a lot of conflicts uh, in Libya, transitions, difficult transitions in Tunisia, in Libya, in Egypt, and we have a serious security threat in our region. I think it is important to to tackle these issues in a holistic and comprehensive approach. I think Twini already said that you cannot only fight against terror by security measures. Yes, it is important that we need to uh, control frontiers, we need to fight against illegal migration, but without any politic, political will and focusing in development, we cannot stabilize the population, we cannot fight against illegal migration, we cannot, cannot create wealth, and we cannot move forward. So for me, I think today, development is essential. Last week, I was in, last Sunday, I was in uh, Abuja, in Nigeria, representing His Majesty King Mohammed VI at the summit of the ECOWAS countries to deal about the crisis in Mali. The approach that we have, uh, uh, approach that we have uh, decided over was very interesting. First, we should give the political negotiations the, the possibility to overcome difficulties, and especially with the movements that are fighting against uh, the regime. I'm talking about Ansar Din and uh, uh, Ansar Din and uh, Emenela. But the other, other, uh, as far as Al Qaeda and as, as far as Mujaw, some military intervention is needed, or maybe some military pressure is needed to fight against terror. Uh, I will say that today everybody knows that uh, we have to face these challenges through political. And I agree with Twini that also the political development is essential. We have to work on our two legs. The first leg is, of course, of the uh, democratic. The, we cannot you know, uh, be able to face uh, terror if we don't use democratic ways. The respect of human rights, the international conventions, and through the political democratization of the countries in the region. And then, of course, then intelligence and other uh, uh, ways of combating terrorism. Today, I will speak about the region. I think that uh, there is a threat today, uh, represented by Al-Qaeda in the Maghreb. Mm -hmm. Qaeda is a real threat. It's a, it's a huge organization that deals with narco-traffic, kidnapping. It's, it's uh, manages a huge amount of money and which represent a security threat for the countries of the region, the Sahelian countries, also for the Maghreb countries, but also for our partners in Europe. So that's why we need to have a joint, I agree with you, Twini, joint action to fight terror. And this, for these reasons, we need some tools. We need some tools. Of course, there is the classical tools of service of intelligence, they're important, but also regional tools. 
and I will so talk also about our own homework. Because we're not, we don't have to only to, to put the, the responsibility on the others. We have to do our own homework as far as the region is concerned. And I'm talking about the Maghreb Arab countries, which kind of role they could play in this, uh, facing these uh, terrorist activities and fundamentalism. There is the Union for the Mediterranean. I think it's important too. There is the new neighborhood policy. I think it's important today. Neighborhood policy represents an opportunity for Europe to work on the region. And I am happy to, say, to, see, to, to see today, and I had uh, the, 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 the occasion to see it last week when Cathy Ashton was in Rabat, and she explained today that European Union is working on the Sahel. Then we should also look beyond the region. And I would today like to speak about the Gulf of Guinea. Today, 30% of the cocaine which is exported to Europe comes from the Gulf of Guinea. And that Antony was in Latin America for a long time. All these narco traffics are now coming through Guinea-Bissau. This creates instability in the region. This also gives appetite to Al-Qaeda because all these terrorist organizations, like in fact in Colombia, they are very much, where, the, where there is money, they go. Cocaine, drug trafficking, other drugs. So it represents also another threat that we should look into it. Now, we should do our homework. We have to build up the Maghreb Arab Union. We have to work on, I'm talking about tools. Tools, of course, democratic transitions in the region, but also inter, regional integration. With no regional integration, we cannot move anywhere. Today, we are stuck in the Maghreb because we cannot build up a future with Algeria, because we need to have a, 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 a coherent regional grouping, the Maghreb Arab Union with the five countries, to not only to fight terrorism, to fight this security threat, but also to build up a common future and share prosperity. Because this is, this, the important is how to create wealth through job creation, because we have created some expectations at the level of the countries of the region, and we have to be at, to be able to respond to this kind of expectation. And that's why, the example, maybe t this afternoon, uh, I will maybe talk about this, the model of Morocco, how we were able to, to build up a genuine democratic model according to our specificities and priorities and you know, to, to, to fight all kinds of extremism. Uh, uh, another tool which is also important, but Sapato is not here, maybe this afternoon I will talk about it, and that he was leading this dialogue of culture and civilizations. Because we need to de deconstruct these, these schemes, these models that are based on uh, deconstructing the models that are based on the peur. And I think Alliance of Civilization is an important tool also that can be used you know, to, to give the real image of Islam, which is in conformity with modernity, in conformity with democracy. And this, I think, is where we can work together. So what we need? I will summarize by it. We need a balanced approach that matches security treatment, cooperation in service intelligence, but also political development, democracy, human rights, build up. Of course, we have uh, witnessed some important democratic transitions today in the region. Of course, we, we still have some difficulties. We should have to work together, but still that we need to uh, uh, build up democratic societies in our region. And three, tools, regionally, uh, NATO, med, med dialogue, union for the Mediterranean, neighborhood policy, uh, regional integration, we need these tools. Uh, and w but what we need, in fact, is, as I'm talking from a southern perspective, we need a real political will to work to face challenges. Now, today, we are stuck in Syria. We are stuck in Mali. At least, at, at least in Mali, we are now, we have something uh, already prepared. We have a CONOPS, which is a, a, a concept of operations. We have a, also a, a strategic concept as far as to, to, to deal with the Malian issue. I think there's a panel on this issue. But today, there is a will to, to, to together in Africa, in the ECOWAS, to uh, tackle these issues. This is, I think, this is the approach of Morocco. Morocco is in the Security Council today. We are uh, working on this basis to move this issue forward. I'm sorry I was so long, but we can take some questions, and I think I will back, come back in the afternoon on some other issues. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Mr. Amrani. I am sure the audience and myself and probably some of the participants would have a lot of questions for you after we, each of them will complete their presentations. Uh, the nightmare of the Western world is if a terrorist organization get a hold of weapons of mass destruction. And I'm so delighted that among us is General Guard, whose work right now is non-proliferation. And also, I would like to introduce the speaker after General Guard, who is Mr. Kazi from Pakistan, where the last time the international community failed to expect some proliferation issue was Pakistan. So I'm trying to make the two guests and who they are, which is unusual. So please go ahead, Mr. Guard, and please, Mr. Ghazi, be ready to challenge what Mr. Guard had to say about non-proliferation. Thank you. Well, I'm going to uh, be somewhat unorthodox, if I may. And uh, I discussed non-proliferation in some detail yesterday and would be prepared uh, to do so during the discussion. But I would like to take a, a different approach uh, just to set up something for the purposes of discussion. You know, analysts are telling us that the world has never been so free of conflict and violence. Now, if this is true, and I have no reason to doubt it, even though it doesn't seem so, it's because of the revolution in communication, paradoxically, which brings to the attention of a much larger proportion of the world conflict, violence, repression, injustice, and deprivation. So I believe that one important framework in moving toward a new operational security architecture is to consider it from the standpoint in the long term of human security rather than national security. We are moving from an interconnected world to an interdependent world, a world society, and despite the frequent use of the term, it certainly is not yet a world community. And yet you, you often hear people uh, talk about the world community uh, having this or that view. Now, I believe there are three elements to human security, and the first, and in the most fundamental way, uh, is freedom from fear. Fear of violence to one's person or to the members of one's family. And of course, in wars, uh, the more traditional form of conflict, it is the civilians who suffer disproportionately. Now, we need, I believe, to try to work toward the effectiveness of many of the conventions that are in effect but are not really honored uh, to the extent that they should be. Uh, the Genocide Convention, uh, the Geneva Conventions and the Two Protocols of 1977, the Biological Weapons Convention, the Convention Against Torture, Chemical Weapons Convention, and then perhaps the most complicated and controversy, controversial of all, the responsibility to protect. Now, I, I will in response to the chairman's mandate say that the single most serious security problem in terms of human security is the possibility of a nuclear war, which would have effects far beyond uh, the targets to which they are directed. And we must continue to give the highest priority 
to the prevention of the proliferation of nuclear weapon states or the acquisition of fissile materials by terrorists. Should they get their hands on a relatively small amount of highly enriched uranium, one needs only to go on the internet to find out how to turn it into an explosive device. So freedom from fear. Second, freedom from want. To ensure adequate food and shelter for the world's population. There's no excuse for hunger. It's a matter of food distribution, not of food production. There should be no toleration of diseases that kill so many children who do not have adequate medical care. It is no longer tolerable for the richest 10% of adults to own nearly 90% of global wealth with the poorest half with barely 1%. The third pillar of human security is living in dignity. Beyond the absence of repression and want, to opportunities for education and gainful employment. The operationalization of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the Convention on Civil and Political Rights. For people to have a voice in representative government, hopefully in increasingly democratic nation states, but do not be optimistic that a democracy is solely the exercise of popular sovereignty through freely elected representatives. It requires an evolutionary process of establishing freedom and liberty in the political process, in economic activity, freedom of religion, freedom of the press, and the development of a civil society of non-government organizations and of significant importance, a reliable rule of law and a minimum social safety net. This is, I know, somewhat pie in the sky, Mr. Chairman, but I think we've reached a stage in this world of it, not only increasing interconnectedness, but it's very clear that we are in a period of interdependence and we, we must not ignore the human condition. And so I throw this out as, as one possible framework uh, that we might consider as we look for security structures in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, General. Uh, the name of Pakistan comes every time we talk about economic growth in the region. They have done tremendously well recently. But at the same time, when it comes to proliferation issues, when it comes to terrorism, Afghanistan. So Pakistan is a pivotal state in that part of the world. And we are so delighted to have with us Ambassador Kazi. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, today is the last day of Me Days. Uh, this uh, 2012, I wish to express my admiration and compliment uh, the Amadeus Institute for, uh, for the excellent arrangements and uh, uh, remarkable and very generous hospitality extended to all of us. Uh, Mr. Chairman, every era has its own challenges. So is the case with our era. But there are also good points. I think. Uh, the unipolarity the glo in the glo on the global scene we saw in the 90s has now given birth to multipolarity. We are moving to more, more and more stakeholders in the international system. Uh, emergence of BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, 
I think is a very, very positive movement. Uh, move, I mean, in, uh, development. Uh, today, the globalization creates a lot of opportunities, but also has uh, poses a lot of challenges and makes us more, more and more vulnerable. But at the same time, it increases the interdependence of individuals, of states, into a kind of a universal community. Whatever happens in one part of the world affects the other part of the world. Uh, I mean, uh, if we are to see the threats that we see today in terms of terrorism, proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, piracy, cybercrime, I mean, the list is enormous. But we have to build new paradigms of negotiations. How we negotiate the international security system, which, which creates security not for just privileged few powerful countries, but the weakest and smallest country in the world. There are the, I think, very important is what we have to move towards is changes in the international security system. Now, today, the international security system revolves around the UN Security Council. Now, UN Security Council, unfortunately, has not been the great performer. During the Cold War, the veto powers and the adversarial relations between the power blocks uh, stampeded its uh, progress. Afterwards, the unilateralism, the preemptive use of force, use of uh, UN system and its uh, subsidiary organizations for, to the advantage of particular country or group of country, impaired the credibility of the international system. We have example of Iraq, where we saw the weapons inspectors as provocateurs, as inciters to violence. They created a ground for 2003 invasion of Iraq. Now, it's the UN, which is the guardian, supposed to be to preserve peace and security, impairs its credibility, its officials and functionaries, to the extent that it adds to the violence. I think that is something we have to see. Coming back to the question of non-proliferation, now here we have to see the five permanent members of the Security Council are the nuclear weapon states. Not only they are, uh, I mean, uh, maintaining the huge nuclear arsenal, but they are continuously advancing and increasing its, uh, its capacity of violence. Uh, non and, uh, the non-proliferation treaty was, came into existence in the 60s, and there was a bargain involved that the countries, sovereign countries, relinquished their right to nuclear weapons. And there was a reciprocity, A, that the nuclear weapon states are going to reduce the nuclear arsenal. B, the uh, treaty countries will, will have the full uh, authorization to develop the peaceful uses of nuclear energy. This was a bargain, international bargain. Now, this was 1969 that this NPT was signed. Today, we are in 2012 we have to see to what extent that bargain has been pulled. I'm sorry, here we have, for instance, you take the example of Iran. Now, one doesn't know for sure what, where does the Iranian nuclear capacity lie, whether it is, as they say, for peaceful uses, or it is beyond that, and they are going towards weaponization. It's one entity's word against another. Uh, but in the region, the same region, there is a nuclear power, which is, an, which is not signatory to 
NPT agreement, which has 200 or so nuclear weapons, which is threatening an NPT state, and for what? For suspicion of producing a nuclear weapon, and this is an old story we have been hearing, that Iran is close three months, four months, six months, two, two years, one year, to producing a nuclear weapon. I think, you know, I am reminded of situation in Iraq, where the, I mean, pretext of uh, weapons of mass destruction, chemical weapons, or biological weapons, were used as a pretext to destroy that country. I was ambassador in Iraq in the early 90s, and uh, I mean, it was very obvious to all of us there that Iraq had, I mean, relinquished its weapons of mass destruction, and there were very strong, this unscom work that was going on. But yet we heard, I mean, this was 1992, I was there in Iraq in, from 92 to 95, and the whole process continued for a very long time. And in 2003, we said, well, they have lots of weapons of mass destruction, so go and destroy them. And the country was invaded, devastated. So are we going in the similar direction in case of Iran? This is a question that we have to see. It's a very serious question. Now, why do countries go for nuclear? I mean, case, uh, take the case of Pakistan. India, our neighboring state, which is seven times larger in size, seven times larger in military strength, conventional military strength, went nuclear in 1973. Pakistan, which feels threatened because most of the Iranian, most of the Indian nuclear, Indian forces are deployed along the Pakistani border. And there's an outstanding dispute between the two countries. What would Pakistan do? Should Pakistan submit to nuclear blackmail, conventional arms blackmail? There are fears, there are apprehensions. So it was in response to Indian nuclear, nuclearization in the, of the region, in the region that Pakistan responded. And we had, to, we had no choice but to go nuclear. But it, if the international community had stopped the Indian nuclearization without discrimination, probably Pakistan and India would not have been the nuclear states. Similarly, I think in Middle East also, you have to see that there is, I mean, no country, uh, there's a nuclear disarmament. The con there's no, no country possesses nuclear weapon. In India-Pakistan context, fortunately, nuclear, nuclearization of South Asia has contributed to maintenance of peace in the same way as between Soviet Union and United States. We are now afraid of each other getting into conflict because we know it will be mutually assured destruction. So nuclearization, unfortunately, is, is, a, is a contributory factor to stability. So it's, it's a discussion that can go on endlessly. And Mr. Chairman, I know you're getting impatient with me, so I leave it uh, there. Thank you.